Thank you very much indeed. I'm honored to be here. You weren't one of my cases, were you? <laughs> okay. This, the founding of metrics, is a truly important event for science. So how do we get here? I'm going to tell you about one of the projects I've been very interested in. And being solipsistic, and if you want to know about words like that, it's all John Eonidis' fault. Uh, forgive that, because this personal history will help you understand how we got to exactly here in this room now. It's 38 years since I became deputy editor in 77 at the New England Journal. By then, my general reading had made me deeply concerned about the quality of the literature, and I had a sort of credibility crisis, or it had a credibility crisis with me. We thought we were publishing the creme de la creme. Half the manuscripts we received, however, were obviously tawdry rubbish. And I indeed published a paper on the ethics of all this in 1979 miserably low standards for the profession I treasured. What really up, woke me up were several dramatic cases right in front of me at the New England Journal of cases what, of what we now call scientific misconduct. It had no name then. Not only no name, but it was universally designed by our elders and better, but denied. It was complete denial, couldn't happen. I was struck by the glaringly obvious fact that peer review, as we practiced, as all journals seemed to practice it then, almost never, I'd say never detected, even gross cases of fraud. If co-authors couldn't, I said to myself, how could peer reviewers? Peer reviewers did not ever find it. In 1978, um, what sort of quality assurance was that? In 78, John Baylor became a statistical consultant at the journal, and I'll say he's a lovely, lovely man. And he came along with Fred Mostella, who became head of statistics at uh, Harvard, who's another lovely, lovely man. And he was, was asking, they were asking Bud Roman the editor-in-chief and me, uh, about a book on statistics they intended to write. And I thought, oh God, not another. And my contribution to the conversation turned out to be very important to me and to this process. And out of the air, I said that they should do some elementary research. They were scientists, weren't they? You can say anything when you're an editor. They should take examples from papers we were busy accepting at the New England Journal what the, and look at what the authors actually did, not what they thought they should do from having read bad books or good books on statistics. And using our files, dissect the merits of any of the stats the authors had employed, and they got this very successful book. And you can look up this history in the preface written by Bud uh, of the book. And I learned then of this mysterious power as an editor I had to push really clever titans of the profession around. And the utility of persu and secondly, the utility of persuading scientists to take a critical, systematic, scientific look at research reporting, to do research on research. And that changed my life, that moment. Anyhow, one way or another, I moved to Chicago and to JAMA. In 83, John Baylor published an article urging a research effort into peer review. I thought I could take advantage of my lessons and twist and leverage a lot. Now, discussions at JAMA we had focused on having a meeting on peer review but remembering the Baylor-Mostella thing, I proposed that JAMA had a 
conference on peer review limited ex exclusively to the presentation of research, bad research, but research, into peer review, and all matters surrounding publication, including the product. I say bad because it wasn't too great at the start. Anyhow, there was no research at the time we thought. We thought, or I thought, interested scientists would identify themselves and at trivial expense, and absolutely no bother whatsoever to me, uh, we might have dozens of research projects, established a field and a community, and I got a lot of help from George Lumberg, editor-in-chief. Now, at the time, my feelings about this were summarized in an editorial I wrote in 1986. I said, there are no bars whatsoever to publication, none. There's no study too fragmented, no hypothesis too trivial, no literature citation too biased or too egotistical, no design too warped, no method um, uh, to warp, no methodology to bungled, no presentation of results too inaccurate, too obscure, and too contradictory, no analysis too self-serving, no argument too circular, no conclusion too trifling and too unjustified, and no grammar and syntax too offensive for a paper to end up in print. And that was demonstrably clear. Now, I was over the hop and over the top and had to be calmed down, but that was a fact. All of those things were facts. And that was in an editorial I wrote to announce the first peer review congress, said it was going to be into research, and anxiously then waited for three years. And in 89, we held the first one because abstracts actually flowed in. The rules were no evidence-free opinion papers at all and no attempts to set rules. Now, the first Congress was contentious and exciting and producting, productive, and surveys said we should have more. And that's an awful lot of work, and a lot of this work came to fall on Annette Flanagan, whom I'm thrilled to see is here, um, who did so much of the heavy lifting We'll be holding our eighth peer review congress in 2017. So what have they done? And the hundreds of studies that have been generated from them, done by other people at other years in other years. First, you sh we showed that you, if you establish a platform, a forum, a means to eventual publication, the number of papers goes up about a hundredfold every year, as opposed to just every fourth year. And that's going to happen here, for sure. Secondly, that the Congresses, though influential, constituted only a small part of the story. It's, I've got a big head, but not that big. The 80s were a great time for research. There was no money then, too, actually. In my field, this was stimulated by the new science of meta-analysis, and Ingram Orkin is in the audience. I'm very moved. Obviously not to hear me, but anyhow. The meta-analysis had stimulated a critical review of the literature. And I'd say that the founding of the Cochrane Collaboration by Ian Chalmers at Oxford in 93, itself enabled by the internet and the web, put huge demands on a more serious approach to full accurate reporting and was an excellent form of post-publication peer review. Best you can have, really. The Congress has produced a lot of information on the administrative aspects, peer review, time, cost, all that, what happened when you blinded, but almost always specific to certain journals. There was almost no information on the cognitive processes of reviewers, perhaps because definitions and endpoints, perhaps because it's so hard, just difficult. 
They provided some comparative information on specific types or arrangements of peer review, say, hiding the uh, reviewer's identities versus hiding the author's identities from the reviewers and so on, use of preprints, open review, blogs. To my disappointment, there, was, there were relatively few papers on the basic ethical flaw of the current system of peer review usually used, uh, where the reviewer is incognito. I find that repulsive, and I have gone along with it my whole life. I always sign my reviews. I think, it, I think that secret justice is against nature, but that's just me. Nobody else seems to agree. It has never been tested properly. Why? The Congress is posed to paradox. Peer review is both a test, except or not, and an intervention to improve the finished paper. The sum total of papers coming from the Congresses adds up to distressingly thin evidence that peer review is worth a huge effort. But that's not what we editors feel and observe. And there's a huge disjunction here between the evidence and our certainty. However scanty that evidence may be, is it, it is at the same time impossible for any journal, fake or not, to pretend that it does not have peer review. You wouldn't even make a fake profit or real profit from a fake journal if you said it had no, no fake peer review. We know what happens when it's, when it's abandoned. Look at what Gary Taubes, who's already here, what he describes so beautifully uh, in Cold Fusion, when Pons and Fleischmann decided to withdraw the manuscript from nature and let, let the University of Utah release the findings at a press conference, Bud Scruggs, <coughs> sorry, the governor's chief of staff commented, we're not going to let some English magazine decide how state money is handled. Well, he's in a minority. People in that position are usually very strongly in favor of peer review and are always accusing journals of not having had it. The Lancet, for example, was sinking fast in 1975 until, as the editor said, the, the Americans made us do it, they introduced uh, peer review. Journals will go bankrupt if they don't have it. They all feel it and get off the stage. Well, no, 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 but uh, I have to ask you to wrap up, I'm afraid. Yes, we'll, I will. We'll hopefully the, give you a chance. They, they will. Just give me two minutes. Absolutely. The, uh, yeah. Maybe one. The big success, the big success of the Congresses was an enormous amount of information about the product. This was pretty much started by Kay Dickerson here, who confirmed the existence and identified the cause of publication bias and measured it repeatedly. Along came trial registration, all as, as a direct result. Then under Doug Altman and David Mower, many other, of the other biases in the literature were identified. And they didn't leave it at that. They got evidence, they weighed it, they published updatable evidence guidelines on how to report trials, tests of clinical tests, meta-analyses. Indeed, Dave suggested once that I get some trialists to rewrite a randomized trial in the form recommended by the standards of reporting trials way back, simply to see what our readers thought. They told us it stank, and that led to consort. There was, these evidence-based guides had a really profound effect on the quality of, of publishing. It's now easier, quicker, more thorough. Uh, the whole thing is better. Showing it is terribly difficult. And there's a lesson there. We're using perhaps the wrong techniques. Professor, I really have to ask you to go to the suggestion. I'm, coming up with my suggestions now. 
and they are, one, that we should do a review of a large, random, a large randomized trial of clinical, of um, uh, peer review across a large number of journals. It'll be costly and difficult. And then I'd say, having said that, what's the point? Even if we found that peer review had a mortality, no one could afford to stop it. So then what? I then think that we should, I think I'll stop there because I put these things into, uh, and I can distribute these, uh, my uh, recommendations oh, yes. later. Yes, absolutely. So um, uh, Professor Rennie had prepared a whole document that we'll be happy to circulate to anyone uh, willing to read uh, his entire experience. Uh, moreover, no. I mean, let's not forget that now we want to open up the discussion right. so there will be more opportunities to, to make further points and we have the breakout sessions where we're really going right. to get nitty gritty. So thank you very much for your interview. Okay. Thank you.